morning, everyone. And happy Mother's Day. We are uh, very blessed to have the influence of mothers in our life, and we want to celebrate them a little bit today. I have a poem. It's kind of a, actually, it's a prayer that I've got that I like to read to start our service off today. Lord, thank you for all mothers and others. For the new ones who endure sleepless nights with infants in arms, for the busy ones who juggle the pressures of home and family life, for the steadfast ones who nurture and care for our special, vulnerable children, for the patient ones who always seek to forgive and engage with their teens, for the persistent ones who cleverly find new ways to connect with their young adults, for the mothers, aunts, grandmothers who step in and cradle and care for the young ones, for all the grandmas who love and support their precious grandchildren and the children of others, for the foster moms that are called to gather and cover the fragile ones, for the Sunday moms who care for our children and lead them in their faith, for the moms who give far beyond their own resources, who overcome disability and discouragement to constantly cherish and love us. Thank you, Lord, for all our beautiful mothers. Help us to support them and keep them in our prayers. Amen. Well, so glad to have you all here this morning. Thank you for those who are joining us online via Facebook Live or maybe uh, YouTube at a later date or through the DVDs. We're glad you're worshiping with us this morning. As far as announcements go, there is a board meeting this Tuesday. There is a training meeting on tomorrow night at 6 p.m. If you are interested, it's not a sign up, but if you're interested in learning about technology and, and volunteering here at the church uh, in our technology area, uh, we could use some more volunteers in the area as we continue to grow. And this is, this is not something that's gonna go away even as the pandemic gets less and less. Uh, the technology is the future. Amen, Josie. <laughs> Thank God for Josie and Cash is here. Come on, Cash. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Enjoy it. Sharon. So that reminds me that a whole bunch of us have got our background checks and, and all of that and been approved. And uh, but we don't have a sign up sheet. So I'm gonna create a sign up sheet. Nice. Be thinking about when you want to sign up, you know, whether we do it uh, for the nursery. Not the flowers this time. You're thinking about when you'd like to sign up to uh, those of us who've had that certification. Um, to sign up for the nursery. Yes, yep. Amen. Amen. All right. This is wonderful. We want to hear them in the service. Please don't feel bad if your child is making noises, man. Jesus said, don't hinder the little ones from coming to me, right? And that's what we were about. It's not a hindrance, it's a joy. Yes, see? Josie's with me. I want to hear some, you guys, follow her lead. So, um, after the service, we will be having communion on the lawn out here. If, you've, um, if you're in this aisle, we ask that you exit out this way. And of course, this aisle, you'll go out that way. If you need prayer after the service, Penny or I or another uh, elder or deacon will be available near one of these windows to pray with you, or maybe just a praise. Or maybe it's a prayer for someone else. Midweek Bible Boost continues. We had a pretty good turnout last Wednesday. It's about 20 minutes, uh, approximately 7.30 to 7.50. Yep, Josie was there once. 7.50, it's about 20, 25 minutes of just a little primer to get you through the week, a little perspective offering through the scriptures and the new men's group. Uh, we've had a couple sign-ups, so we're up to about half a dozen guys. We're looking to do a monthly fishing trip or a shooting range or maybe an outreach, uh, help someone out. So please let me, Greg or Jimmy, know about that. Any other announcements? Well then... Let's worship the Lord on this beautiful day by joining together in the call to worship. Would you please stand? Found in your bulletin. 
If you're joining with us live this morning, you can find that in your email. If you would like to receive the email, please let us know. We'll make sure to send it out to you. You have seen my misery. You have known the troubles of my soul. My strength has failed because of my guilt, and my body wastes away. I will rejoice and be glad in your mercy and grace. My days and my life are spent in sorrow, and my years with sighing. Amen. Well, one thing about our God, He is a gracious God, and He deserves all the glory for what He's done for us through Jesus Christ on that cross. Let's join together and sing of His grace and His glory. God of grace and God of glory. Today's prayer of the day goes along with the sermon theme. Would you join with me as the Lord gives sincerity to our words and we pray the prayer of the day and we follow it with the Lord's prayer. Dear Lord, there is a time to work harder.
sings. Maybe we should have him back. That was wonderful. All of you sound beautiful. We're talking about that change in our life, but we're going to talk about it after we pray. <laughs> A little excited about the message there. Sorry. We need to go before the Lord together. Would you pray with me? I'd like to lead us in a time of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause to remember who you are, your holiness, your glory, your mercy, your grace that you came down to rescue us, to save us by becoming one of us. How Jesus came, our Lord Jesus, and died on the cross for us, humbling himself all the way to the cross, serving us by giving his life as a ransom for many. And then raising from the dead with power. 
Lord, help us to live in light of those truths that the gospel changes our life. No matter what we've been through, no matter what's in our past, no matter the discouragement, no matter the sin or regret or the shame, your grace is sufficient and more than we could ever need. We invite you here this morning. We pray for the moms. We pray for moms in our community, in our church, in our world, for you to bless them and encourage their hearts. Continue to use them in, in young people in all of our lives. We give you thanks for them. And not just the moms, but the, the women who invest and nurture and encourage us. We thank you for them and pray your blessing upon them. We also lift those who lift up those who are um, shut in and are going through difficult times, specifically the people on the back of our bulletin. We ask for your blessing on them, for your healing, for you to be near. Um, you know each one, Lord. We pray for those who are next to us in this room, for your blessing on them, whatever they're carrying with them today, for the unspoken request we may have. Help us all, Lord, to draw closer to you, to find strength from you, to find life from you. May we learn to be those who study and be disciples of Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Now the sermon. <laughs> So we're in. Uh, we're taking a break from Ephesians for a Mother's Day message. I think today's it's a short story. It's a short story that happened, and it uh, it's loaded with meaning. It's extremely relevant for moms. It's extremely relevant for anyone who is carrying a lot of weight. People who, all of us are struggling with anxiety to different degrees. Some people with excessive anxiety, um, even, you know, worry, uh, feeling maybe abandoned by God, maybe completely losing perspective. And this story is for us. So it's, yes, it's really relevant for moms because their job is never done and, and they, they take a lot of hits and they take a lot of hurts. Um, but also for all of us who choose to invest our lives in others. So let me read for you Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching but Martha, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to Jesus. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her. Answered her Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. God's word for God's people. Amen. Amen. All right. Poor Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha. All you Marthas out there, this just feels like such a hit. Come on, be like Mary. Look at Mary. So worried about everything. All you Martha, all you responsible ones that worry about everybody, all your kids, all your grandkids, all your great-grandkids. You're just, you're, we're holding the weight of the world, right? Is Jesus really rebuking Martha here? I mean... She's the one who invited him over, the text said. We just read that. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. So she's the head of the home. She welcomed him over. So I can't imagine how she felt hours before. I know what Dana's like hours and hours before someone comes over. Vacuuming again, right? The place is super clean. She's very busy. Can you imagine the Messiah is coming over? 
Can you imagine her stress and bringing a crowd with him? Her house was probably going to be packed. And this is what Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing's necessary. Is he saying, really, quit being Martha? Be like Mary? Be someone you're not? I asked for about five, uh, some things that uh, the average woman probably struggles with when people come over, before people come over, and this is what I received. Is the home clean enough? Will the guests be comfortable? Yes, you can relate to that. Come on, how about this side? Can I hear a man on this side? All right, there it is. Will the guests be comfortable and enjoy themselves? Will the food be ready? Will there be enough food? How many, maybe teenage boys or young men will be there, right? <laughs> Especially those disciples. Jeez. Will I be a good host? And that's just the beginning. The list probably goes on. What do other people think? Am I enough? Will it taste good? What if someone doesn't like this? What if someone's allergic to quinoa or whatever, right? You know, I got to stick up for, for Martha. Does anyone else want to stick up for Martha here? Right, come on. Who's going to make the deviled eggs without Martha? This church, this fellowship, when we have a potluck dinner, oh, I miss them. We have a potluck dinner. Amen? I mean, it's not like, oh, well, I'm just going to stop right there. It's like you're going to a nice restaurant. The women in this group, the, the women's fellowship, and, and whoever else makes meals, I should say, maybe some guys are cooking. I know David likes to cook, but we have incredible meals at these fellowships. I am just really into it. I try not to sin at every single one of them by overeating. It is difficult, man, those deviled eggs. Mm. The potato salad. You know how they add the mustard in there? It's kind of yellowish. The coleslaw. Have you bought coleslaw? Ugh. Really? you got to get some coleslaw from Louisa Christian Church. It's incredible. Barbecue chicken. I'm starting to get hungry. The beans. And I love the celery sticks when they, someone knows how to put the like cream cheese in it and they flavor it up with something, paprika. You following me? This, I love Martha's. Who's going to set up the chairs and the tables if it's not for the Martha's? I think Jesus liked the Martha's of the world too. I think he liked eating. You know, he compared heaven to a feast. In fact, this is an interesting story. Um, after Jesus rose from the dead in the Gospel of Luke, you know, G Luke interviewed people because he wasn't there. Um, he met the guys on the road to Emmaus. He's risen from the dead, and it says, he's like, come on back, come on back to town, come back to church, right? He, he meets Mary, not this Mary, different Mary at the tomb, right? And then the disciples are hiding, so he shows up in the disciples' room. Right? And they're freaking out. Right? He's like, peace be with you. Calm down. Right? And this is what the text says in Luke 24, 40 to 42. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Look, guys, it's me. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, so they're still like this, you're a spirit, you're a ghost or whatever. They're still not getting it. Right? What does Jesus say? He says something to them. What would you say? I mean, can you imagine what he said? He, I would never dream up that he would say, do you guys got anything to eat? Can you imagine Luke writing this down? They're like He's like, really? He really said that. They're like, yep, write it down. Jesus shows up resurrected from the dead, and the first thing he asked for is some food. He liked food. Jesus apparently liked eating. I don't think Jesus was lowering service, being a servant below worship. I think Jesus considered it a form of worship. In fact, in Matthew 20, 28, it says, the Son of Man came, and that's Jesus talking about himself. This is Jesus speaking. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when he says, Martha, Martha, you know, you're all worried. I think we need to go a little deeper. We need to take a look at the text. What's he saying here? Because a lot of us can relate to being a Martha. A lot of us carry a lot of weight. A lot of us are worried. A lot of us are responsible ones. So let's take a look exactly what Martha said to him. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Think about that. Go back one. Do you not care that my... What is that? I've used this line. If you love me, you would do what I want, right? Is this not a guilt trip? Yeah. She lays a guilt trip on the Son of God. <laughs> really? Right. And they're close friends. I mean, gee, Martha shows up a lot in the story. She's always the one on the go. She's always the one having a discussion. She's kind of left brain. She's the one serving. She's a leader. And this is what... So what does this tell you? Martha has... Yeah, I know, Josie, right? Martha has been worried about this meal and serving. And now... All these people are coming and she can't keep up. And she looks and there's her sister sitting down at Jesus' feet, not helping, doing nothing. So what does she do? She keeps working. What, what, what's going on in her head? She's getting madder. Have you been there? This isn't fair. I'm the one doing everything. What are you doing? Especially if it's a sibling. Come on. It's a sibling. And you know Mary... If your sibling's mad at you, you know they're mad at you. They don't even have to be in the same room. They could be in another state, and you know they're mad at you. Mary knew that Martha was steaming about her, and I bet when she spoke up to interrupt Jesus, Mary was probably like, here we go. So for Martha to say this to Jesus, you know she popped, right? She just exploded. She's upset. And then what does she say? Look at this. Tell her then to help me. What did she just do? She gave the Son of God a commandment. <laughs> the 11th commandment according to Martha. Tell my sister to help me, Jesus. She didn't say, Jesus, what do you think about, you know, getting some help from me? No, she gave him an order. I, I can't imagine if the angels in the room were probably like, did she just say that? I know. Oh my. Right? This is the son of, this is God in the flesh. And she's like, tell her to help me, Jesus. She gives him an This is important. This is, why is this important to us? Because of Jesus' response is different than we would think it would be. I know, right? It's a lot different. In fact, I'm loving Josie being here. In fact, I would think Jesus would say, excuse me, Martha, can we talk about this later? I'm right in the middle of teaching. Or, Martha, did you forget who I am? Right? I'm going to raise your brother from the dead later on. Did you forget who I am? Right? No. He doesn't confront her. He doesn't rebuke her. What does he do? He says, Martha, Martha. He says her name twice. Martha, Martha. In the Bible, when you say someone's name twice, it's an expression of remorse or empathy. It's a way to say love. When King David's son was killed, Absalom, do you remember what he said? Absalom, Absalom. He repeated his name twice. Right? Jesus is like that. He gets you. When you say things you ought not to say, whether it's to someone else or to him, he's not going to push you away. When someone else does, he is gracious and forgiving. He knows you. He calls you by name. Vincent, Vincent, come on. Instead of giving me what I deserve, he offers her grace. Amen, right? 
And then what does he do? You're so anxious and troubled. You're, and the Greek words are really strong here. You're full of like turmoil, like you're at sea, like a ship raging inside. Martha, you are losing it if you don't mind the vernacular, right? You're losing it about many things. It's taking you over. All you're thinking about is all this stuff, everything around you. Martha, all these things, it's become not about me anymore. It's become about you. Because what does he say? One thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. But he doesn't say what it is. And there's only, what, one verse left? What is it, Jesus? What's the one thing? Well, this is how he explains what it is. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. I like how the message puts this verse. You know, it's, it's a paraphrase, so I don't always like it, but sometimes it really gets the heart of it. One thing only is essential in Luke 10, 42, the message. And Mary has chosen it. It's the main course. And it won't be taken away from her. What's the main course? What is the one thing? Jesus said in John 6, 48, 51, this is Jesus talking. I am the living bread. He's the course. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. I'm, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. For the life of you. There's a feast being served, Mary, but it's not you. It's not your food. There's a servant in the room, Mary. It's not you. It's me. I'm the main thing, not you. You've lost track of the first command to love the Lord God with all first, above all things, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. Why are you doing what you're doing? If why do I preach? Why do what what am I looking for after the service? If I'm like, oh I man, a lot of people said good sermon. Oh yeah, go Vince. You know the problem with that is when no one says anything, I'm like, I hate myself. You're dependent on other things. Look, there is no, and it, we're all like this. And, and people struggle with this, maybe, particularly moms, I think. Am I enough? Am I doing enough? Will people be happy? How do people perceive me? All oh, their minds are so busy, it all weighs in on us, and all of it goes back to I. As David Childers said at Bible study, take the I out of better and you get bitter. And because we're a sinking ship, we're full of turmoil, tumultuous, we're going to go down. Unless we remember why we're doing what we do. Why, are, why is the singing team up here singing? Right? To give a gift to God. Why is Greg operating the PowerPoint? Why is Pat picking the hymns? Why are some of you filling the freezer? Why are you doing what you're doing to serve people? If it's for appreciation, guess what? Sometimes you'll get it and sometimes you won't. If it's to be noticed by others, sometimes you'll get it, sometimes you won't. Josie will always get it from me. Because I'm just glad she's here. When you live for God, he's pleased. If I preach a sermon and go, God, did you like it? That frees me to be me. Jesus is the only one who loves me completely Amen. for me. Jesus is the only one who loves you completely, even when you lose it for you. Even when you say, Jesus, if you love me, you let me have my way. Right? Even when you order them around, Jesus says, Really, Vincent, Vincent, I'm not going to strike you with lightning right now. <laughs> because that's what I deserve. We don't give him the respect he needs. And, and, and the bigger thing is, he's come to be the living bread. He is the feast. 
Mary's not, you're not providing it. When, you, when people are coming over, are we setting the table and preparing the meal for Jesus? Because if you run out, it's okay. Because Jesus knew, knows you did your best. If you cooked your best and people don't like it, it's okay. Do you get it? Are you following this? It's what you were made for. That's why this story is so relevant. Martha, just love her. I know, me too. Martha had her agenda. She had her goals. Her identity was wrapped up in it. Her success was wrapped up in it. Her reputation. She lost what life was about. What do we pray when we do the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come in me. When, the, when you pray for the Lord's kingdom, you know what you're praying? Close, Josie. Try again. You're praying for God to be the king of your life. Amen. What do you pray next? Thy will be done. Are you praying that? Is that what you mean? Because that's what we're praying every week. Now look at this. Mark or Luke 10, 38. No, I, I don't know which one this is. I think it's 42. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. This is the last verse of the section. Mary has chosen the good portion. Some of your translation says good part. Some of the translations say Mary's chosen the good part. I don't like that. It's accurate, but it's misleading when you think of how we think of that word. According to our vernacular, it doesn't work because it's like, well, I did my part. Did you do your part? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a portion. So when, when, back in the Old Testament, when Joseph was feeding his brothers because he was head of, he was leading with Pharaoh, they came and visited him because there was a famine in the land. I don't know if you know the story or not, but it says that Joseph, because Benjamin was there and he loved his little brother, he gave him five portions of the meal. Mary got her portion. Martha, you're not even eating the crumbs. You get it now? Mm -hmm. Mary got her portion. It's not that sitting is better than serving. It's that who is your feast? Who are you doing it for? Who are you living for? Who are you bringing in? Who's your nourishment? Think about it. Communion. Jesus wanted us to remember he's the food. We eat the bread and drink the wine. He's the cup. It's him. Mary's chosen a good portion here, Mary, and you're... Or Martha, and you're getting nothing. And I'm not going to take it away from her. I'm not answering your prayer. Not the way you want me to. Here's what we ultimately need to give up. We need to give up. This is the most Christian thing you can do. And you might not hear many pastors say this, but this is the most important Christian thing you can do. Accept the gospel in your life. Accept the cross in your life fully, not just in word. Ex Come on, Josie. They're not getting it. Accept the cross. Get, let, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take the forgiveness. Let it wash you clean. Let it wash away the shame. Let it wash away the regret. Be free. Enjoy the meal because it's Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, and 8 through 10. Look, here's the meal. Here's how it's served. It's grace. For by grace you've been saved. Through performance. Wait, what? No. Through preparation. Wait, what? Through the perfect meal. Through the perfect entertainment. Through the great reputation. Through having success. No! Through faith. Trust that the cross wipes you clean. Amen. And your life will be changed. You want to change in your life? That's where it begins. Look at the next verse. And this is not your doing. Could Paul be more clear? It's the gift of God. Again, not the results of works or preparation or anything you do, anything you do. 
So you can't boast. You don't have to worry about it. Give it up. It's not about you. The dinner's not about you. The feast, it's not about you. Your service is not about you. It's not going to earn you anything with God. He already loves you through what Christ did for you on the cross. Completely. All you can do now is love him when you serve and love him back because there's nothing greater. And then look. See, this is how Paul ends the next, with the next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for sitting. No. And there's a time for that. For good works. See, that's what grace does. It motivates us, and it gives us the right motives, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Would you sing, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee? Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Amen? Amen. Sing it from your heart. Would you please stand? of God go out on this day hungry and thirsty for more of Jesus, the true feast, the true bread, the true drink. In his name, amen. Amen. Are we doing this squirrel, amen? Oh, we're going to do a song. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, come on up, Derek. Come on, Derek. Yeah, we did this this morning uh, earlier, and uh, we want to do it again. Thank you. Wait. All right. Okay, there you go. Okay. One, two, one, eight. Sailing through this journey of life. Celebrating good times and dealing with the strife. There's one place you really need to know. Trust in Jesus. Come on, let's go. Let's go and worship together. Let's go. Sometimes when we read the Bible, the word is hard to understand. But when we study together page by page, it all comes together. Amen. Amen. Let's go and worship together. Let's go and praise the Lord. Let's go be a family. Lord and
and Savior, he died on the cross. Said he'd be back someday. Jesus wants us to love one another. Let's be ready on Judgment Day.